Okay, um, welcome everyone. My name is Michelle Pilati. I am the project director for the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges Open Educational Resources Initiative. And it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome you to the third Cal OER virtual conference. I also get the pleasure of introducing our keynote speakers. So welcome to our first day here. Our theme is building a stronger open education community in California, which really is what Cal OER is all about. It is an event intended to bring people from California together to talk about what we're doing, but also to share what's happening across the country. I hope you will see from our keynote selections that we are emphasizing looking at how you grow um, OER at a large level. And we will begin today with two uh, presentations from colleges that are doing great work that um, hopefully we all can learn from. This event is made possible, next slide please, by the organizing committee, which consists of representatives from the three segments of public higher education in California, the community colleges, the California State University, and the University of California. The University of California is represented by Nicole Carpenter from UC Irvine and from Delmar Larson from UC Davis and also Libertex that I'm sure you will learn more about. Also, we have Leslie Kennedy from CSU, California State University Affordable Learning Solutions and also Gabrielle or Gabby Rice also from CSU Affordable Learning Solutions. And from the California Community Colleges, we have myself and Cynthia Roscoe from Long Beach City College. Also sort of our honorary organizing committee member is uh, Selena Silva, who is staff from the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, um, and is Selena and her team that behind the scenes makes everything possible. Uh, in your sessions, you will see a moderator most of the time. It will be either a member of the organizing committee um, or two of the Academic Senate staff, um, Amy and Kayla, who are there to assist you, and Selena will be moving around. And so if you encounter any problems, there are people available to help you. Hopefully everyone's comfortable here in Zoom um, and there will not be any of those challenges. Next slide, please. We have sponsors for the event, three from within our system, the Open Educational Resources Initiative, LibreTexts, and California State University Affordable Learning Solutions. We are also pleased to have the support of the Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation. So thanks to all of our sponsors for helping to make this possible. Next slide, please. We are pleased to be able to provide live captioning for all sessions. We also have, as you can see, um, ASL interpreting for the general sessions and then also for selected breakouts. So um, we're really happy that, that those um, opportunities were available to be provided. So hopefully that will be a benefit to a lot of people. Um, I, and note that the captioning is a live human captioner. So it should be quality and useful to, to all. Next slide, please. Um, if you haven't noticed, we are in a familiar space. We are in Zoom essentially. So we have chat, we have the ability to raise hands, all things that I think most people are used to. As always in Zoom, please be sure to mute yourself if you are not already muted. Uh, we encourage the use of the chat. In any session, if there is time for questions and answers, please raise your hand and unmute when called upon, but also feel free to ask questions in the chat. All of the sessions are going to be recorded and they will be available on Zoom events, for, in the, on Zoom events in the platform that we are in now for six months after the event, and you will be notified when those recordings are available. All of our general sessions, both the keynotes and tomorrow morning system updates will be available on the Cal OER YouTube channel, which you can find at tinyurl.com forward slash Cal OER archive. If you go there now, you can see our keynotes and system updates from the past two years. Next slide, please. I'm going quickly through the introductions because I wanna give as much time as possible to our keynote speakers who are speaking on education as a right, not a privilege, how two colleges are seeing access, success, teaching and learning excellence through OER and zero textbook cost initiatives. 
For this first keynote, we actually have two speakers collaborating with one another to share what each of their colleges are doing. And most appropriately, we have a faculty member a faculty member collaborating with an administrator. And I like to highlight that because without faculty uh, commitment and faculty making the choice to do the work to move to OER or to ZTC, it doesn't happen. And without the administrative support of those faculty, it doesn't it also doesn't happen. Next slide, please. So our presenters today are Andy Atkins Pogue, who is a librarian and the Affordable Educational Resources Committee Chair, leading ZTC efforts at Cosumnes River College. And with her is James Preston, the president of West Hills College Lamar. And without further delay, I will um, pass the microphone <laughs> to Andy and James. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Andy, do you want to do a quick sound check also? Uh, can everyone hear me as well? Perfect. Fantastic. All right. Well, we are so excited and blessed uh, to, to co-present today. And like Michelle said, um, it takes a village. It takes faculty administration working together to what we do in Lemoore. We call it the OER revolution. So, Michelle, I just want to thank you for your leadership um, with OERI over the past few years. Um, and you'll get to hear I'm kind of the format this morning. I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes um, and then do a five minute Q&A. Um, and then Andy's going to talk for 20 minutes, do five minute Q&A, and then we'll open it up with any remaining time that we have just to share the journeys of West Hills College and more and consume this river college. So um, I want to thank Andy for she's been great in terms of coordinating and putting our slides together. Um, and our college president, um, Dr. Edward Bush is fantastic just what's going on at that. At college. So let me start. Let me share our journey um, at West Hills College Lamore. Next slide, please. This is me and Andy. Next slide, please. <laughs> Good. So if you're not familiar with West Hills College Lamore, we are the home, very home of the Golden Eagles uh, with 109th Community College in California. So we're relatively new, accredited in 2006. Uh, we are rural. Uh, we're 45 minutes south of Fresno, so we're part of the Central Valley, probably part of the Central Valley. We're a Hispanic serving institution. Um, approximately 3,000 to 3,600 FTEs. That number's, you know, a wide range during our pandemic time. But like many of you, uh, we are on the bounce back and somewhere between 4,500, 6,000 headcount. Um, in terms of our, our students and modalities, um, currently about 68% of our classes are face-to-face. -face. Um, the remainder are, um, are online. We only have about 40 to 50 full-time faculty, so we're, we're small. Um, but we are an Achieving the Dream Leader College, so we've been part of the Achieving the Dream Network for a number of years. And our mission, our vision for ourselves and our sister college, West Hills College, Kalinga, and our district um, is the relentless pursuit of student success. Next slide, please. So I, I've been using this phrase for a long time. I even have a, a, a coffee cup uh, that says the same thing right here. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, uh, but it talks about the OER evolution. Um, and so this is something that we've been doing for a while at West Hills College Lemoore. Uh, we started in 2016, oh, 2016 with some faculty champions and a grant from Achieving the Dream. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. Um, but we really started at our college with one very basic focus seven years ago. And that was just to eliminate textbook costs for students. That's the reason we went into this journey. Um, and so we started it as a revolution against textbook publishers and the outrageous costs and increasing costs of textbooks. But what it very quickly turned into was an evolution of teaching and learning. And I always tell people, I wish that that was intentional. I wish we knew what we know now going in and we could say that we did this intentionally from the beginning. Um, but seven years in, out of the gate, it was about textbook costs. And as we went along, um, it really became an evolution and a revolution. So that's why we have our term, the OER evolution. Next slide, please. So our OER evolution began a number of years ago, and I want to kind of, oftentimes we talk about standing on the shoulders of others, and there's been so many champions for when this journey began for us, and I know by listing people, I'm going to miss people, and so if I, if I miss your name, um, just know that at some point in your journey, if you've connected with us, thank you um, for what you've done for our students and our faculty, but on the screen, you see a few of our faculty champions who were really starting to look at OER even before we got any grants, before we started any official movement. So Dr. Vera Kennedy, um, Alan Fortune, Mike Miguel, psychology and sociology instructors, 
Um, you also see one of the legends. Um, I think if there was a Hall of Fame for OER, Una Daly would be in that Hall of Fame. And so Una and Richard Sebastian are the other photograph. And they came early on to come visit the college with the first grant that we got from Achieving the Dream, which was to start an elementary education transfer degree. And that degree was important for us because 45 out of those 60 units were general education, which has really allowed us to move um, to a lot of ZTC degrees. At our campus, we've had champions along the way, and many of them are on the call today um, in the Zoom room. So Dr. Ron Oxford out of the gate, um, who is now, now retired and is, is second, second round doing additional OER work. Um, Kelsey Smith, many of you know Kelsey. She's our OER librarian. She's really been a champion for us um, throughout this, not only at our college, but region-wide, statewide. Um, achieving the dream, the chancellor's office, obviously with the ZTC funding. Um, out of the gate, we were um, a technical assistance provider along with College of the Canyons, which leads me to say thank you to James Gigi. I just call him James Gigi. You know James if you've been in the OER world. So just a lot of people that have been really involved um, along the way as this OER evolution began. Um, and really the Chancellor's Office in the last couple of years, really thinking about resources. Um, Shell and I and a number of people on the call served on the Burden-Free Instructional Materials Task Force, which is the longest name task force, I think, in the history of... Uh, a ch a Chancellor's Office Task Force, but it's done some great work that led to some recommendations um, that you'll be hearing a lot more about throughout the conference as they roll out. Next slide, please. So again, it started with our students um, back in 2017. <clears throat> and these are just a few quotes. I won't read through them, but you know, as we've gone along, we try to document and, and hear from students and just get better each step of the way. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that and how to start your own OER evolution today. But just a few quotes from students after the first semester we went in, just talking about how important this was for them. Next slide, please. So the early years. So just to kind of give you some hope, if, if you're starting your journey, I think everybody's on very different places with OER and CTC. And so I know when we kind of started going to different conferences and workshops and started the work, we were amazed at other groups and how much they had done. Um, and then a couple of years later, we go to different conferences and people were just beginning. And I think we're, we're across the spectrum when it comes to this. But when you see in a moment where we are today, I want to let you know that our journey when we started um, looked like this. We started in fall 2017. Um, that fall, we had eight courses that were OER or ZTC. We had 33 sections. Um, we saved our students $133,000 that fall. Um, and that initially was built out of a number of different grants that we had been seeking. But today, um, we're pretty excited. Go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. We're excited about where we stand today. And again, shout out to Kelsey Smith for putting this together. But here, here's where we stand today. Um, up, to, up to now, we've saved our students $8.1 million. And I'll talk later about, um, I'll, talk, I'll talk later, hold on one second, excuse me. We'll talk a little bit later about uh, kind of the economics and the math behind OER. So we're a small college. If you're a larger college, if you're serving 15, 20, 30,000 students, you can expect to see numbers that are double, triple, quadruple what we're looking at today. But as of today, $8.1 million saved. We have 26 zero textbook cost degrees and certificates pathways available for our students. Some of them are listed there. We've served 86,000 students. So we've, we've done a good job of quantifying and tracking our data as we go along. So we have an idea of what we're doing. And in addition to using open textbooks and a variety of sources that are out there, a number of our faculty have also um, stepped into doing some OER um, writing. So they're, they're authors. So we've had a lot of success um, with our OER evolution. Next slide, please. So the question is, you know, James, those are great numbers. That sounds very exciting. Um, you, you might be doing something similar. You might not quite be there yet, but I can tell you it is very, very possible. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about um, three wins and three foundations to starting your own OER evolution. And at the end, we'll also do a little bit of uh, what I call uh, myth busting. So some myths that are out there about OER and CTC that we have found to, to not be true, um, that oftentimes are reasons why people don't want to go this direction. Um, so we'll do a little bit of that at the end. Next slide, please. So three wins, three wins. So the first win, the obvious one we went in for, right? So that was affordability. And our community college system is doing an incredible job um, with the affordability fight for our students, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's housing, whether it's trying to address the digital divide. Um, textbooks sometimes is in that conversation and sometimes it's not. And thankfully, the last couple of years, that's really been on more on the radar. 
Um, I think a lot of colleges have attempted to address text forward to build textbook affordability in a variety of ways. Um, we've tried textbook checkout programs. Uh, we've tried putting textbooks on reserve. Um, our students go to websites like cheapesttextbooks.com, right? Because when they see a textbook for a course is $200, they're going to find the best way to, to find a cheaper version of it. Um, but at the end of the day, what we found at our college is the best way to save our students money is to create a quality course with OER materials um, and make that zero textbook cost. I referenced earlier exponential OER math, and I kind of want to play with that. I'm, I'm a, actually an English teacher by trade. I taught for 17 years before I went into administration, but I've become much more mathematical, I think, in my administrative role. I'm starting to exercise that side of my brain a little bit more, um, and I'm, a, I'm had the privilege and honor to serve with our math and science faculty. So they've, they've taught me how to use math and understand data in a, in a much better way. But I just want to share with you how exponentially OER can impact um, from a fiscal standpoint for students. So back in the day, I ran a program called Team Teach um, that was for future teachers that we had at West Hills College Lemoore. And we were really excited because we had a textbook checkout program. So the beginning of each semester, we would, you know, we'd purchase through a variety of grant funds, through sponsors, through donors. We created a textbook checkout library. And each semester, we would spend the first week of the semester connecting with our students and check out about 250 books a sem semester, which over 10 years at about $100 saved our students about a half a million dollars over 10 years. And we were really proud of that. And this was going back from like 2005 to 2015. Um, when our college shifted to using OER in just one year by adopting OER and creating CTC courses, we saved our students $632,000, right? So here we were 10 years of a textbook checkout program versus one year of an OER evolution. Um, it swallowed it up in one year because it's just a matter of exponential OER math. Same thing if you think about classes, how simple it is if you take one class, the impact it can have. So back in the day, again, um, Barbara Ilowski came out. If you, if you know Barbara, she's done incredible work in the OER space. She came out to talk to us about an OpenStax textbook and statistics that our math faculty adopted. We only have 12 sections of stats in a semester, 40 students in those courses approximately. The textbook was about 128 before we went over. So it's $61,000 worth of savings. So again, think about that in terms of at West Hills College, the more we have 12 sections, but at your institution, you might have 12 but you might also have 40 or 50 or 200. So you just take that multiplier um, and look at the amount you can save students. And then again, uh, our community college system early on, um, our initial ZTC funding was for $5 million for 23 colleges to create zero textbook cost degrees. This was back in 2017, 18. Um, that $5 million that was invested by the community college system led to $40 million in savings for students. So win one, um, and the one that most of us go in initially for is affordability. Next slide, please. Win two in the OER revolution is teaching and learning. And so again, I wish this was intentional and I wish I could say that we had this all figured out when we started our journey, but here's the reality with community college. So prior to teaching at the community college for 11 years, I taught high school for six. And before I taught high school, I had a year learning how to become a teacher. I went through student teaching. I had a master teacher. I learned all about pedagogy and teaching methodologies. In the California community college system, in order to teach, you have to have a master's degree in your subject matter, or you need to be, you know, just you have to have vocational experience if you're if you're teaching CTE. And typically, when our, our folks come in, um, what they get when they walk in, they've met minimum qualifications. Um, we give them a sample syllabus, um, we give them a textbook and publisher materials, and then hopefully we've done a number of different things, like with professional development, with mentoring on our campuses, but a lot of our faculty, that's it, discipline matter experts, but haven't necessarily been taught how to teach. And so this OER evolution has really become a way for us to engage in professional development and teacher training. It's really freed us from textbook dependency. Um, so it, it, it's made us more objectives and outcomes driven. So honestly, um, I'll give credit to Alan Fortune, our psych instructor for this one. He talked to me about a year after we're in the OER revolution. He said, it's so refreshing to talk about concepts and not chapters. And I was like, what do you mean, Alan? He said, well, about a year ago, he said, if I was to stop someone on campus and say, you know, what are you doing in class this week? The answer would be chapter three. 
right? And now if you ask somebody what they're doing, they'll say, oh, if it's biology, for example, they'll say, oh, we're studying osmosis this week, right? It really flipped it and we're not dependent on um, the textbook publisher and the materials out of the gate. Um, for us, a lot of that best practice in terms of creating a course, and this is a strategy that I shared um, with our task force at the state that I think a lot of you uh, might find helpful. So in order for a course to become an OER course, right, within a Canvas shell, we go through an approval process. So a faculty member takes the Canvas shell, they might take an open textbooks, videos, materials, they might create some content themselves. And then for it to become officially CTC, they have to go through an approval process. And starting a number of years ago, um, we've used the OEI rubric. So many of you are CBC OEI colleges, right, and you use this rubric for approval for online courses, but we've actually been using that for zero textbook courses also. So it's a way to make sure that we have quality, we have accessibility. Additionally, um, we do a summer institute for our faculty, so they're able to come for a week at a time and talk about OER um, and other different topics too, but we do very intentional summer PD. Um, and then we've, we've also launched an OER bootcamp that we've done a couple of times throughout the state just to kind of take people a week long um, through the basics. So the second win, um, teaching and learning. Third win, next slide, please, or three wins. So the next, uh, the next, the third one is um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, right? So again, if we're leaning on just the textbook publishers, we're being given what they think is best, um, what they think serves our students best. But at the end of the day, we know our students best, and our students look very different and have very different lived experiences depending on where they live within California. Um, where they live, even within Central California, where we are, you can drive 15, 20 miles and a student is going to have a very different lived experience, whether it's a little bit more rural, a little bit more in the city. So by having open educational resources in your courses, you have culturally re relevant materials. Um, you can adapt your teaching, right, to culturally responsive teaching. We can have more open pedagogy, so different ideas and sharing, and it truly becomes a collaboration. Michelle talked about the importance of having faculty and, and administration working together in an OER evolution. And I would add the third component to that is our students, right? They start to create content. They start to bring content. They start to share content and share ideas. Um, and so it's awesome. I have a couple pictures on here just to remind me of a couple things with, as it relates to accessibility in our students. Um, so the first one is a picture of a note, uh, no disrespect to Chevron, but the first one is a picture of a of a, a Chevron gas station sign. And the reason why I do that is, as I talked earlier about our textbook checkout program that we used to have, um, when we ran that program back in the day before the OER revolution, uh, if we had a textbook that changed edition, I would sit down and look at the sixth edition, for example, for a biology class and the seventh edition. And then I would flick through the pages to see what the differences were. Right, because the price has just gone up $30 for the newest edition. And can you use a six edition? Well, the student's gonna ask, can I use a previous edition because I can find it cheaper? And oftentimes it was as simple. I remember this is why I have the Chevron picture. Oftentimes it's as simple as just changing photos. I remember looking at two editions, six to seventh, and on page 12, content exactly the same, everything exactly the same, but instead of the picture of a Chevron station, there was a picture of a Shell station. And I remember that moment thinking, man, we really need to do something. Um, it's just not fair. The biggest thing I think for me recently, the, the biggest aha realization um, has really been about day one access, right? So many of you have done focus groups with your students to learn how to better create OER or, or understand textbook challenges. You'll know that your students aren't getting their textbooks until week three, um, week nine, possibly not at all, right? And so the way I equate uh, having a ZTC course, because ZTC course, you have day one access, right? A student, as soon as they're registered in your class, if you have a Canvas shell and all of your materials are in there, they have day one access to all the materials. It levels the playing field. What we have without that is an uneven playing field. It's not accessible, it's not equitable, it's not fair. Um, I'll give you an example. It's like we're telling students, um, I'm a big sports fan, so it's like telling our, our students, hey, we're, we're so excited. We're a baseball team, right? I'm the coach. I'm so excited to have you on my baseball team, right? And just imagine that the teacher is the coach and the students is the players, right? It's first day of the semester. I'm so excited. So first day of being on the team, we're so excited. We're going to go out to the practice field right now. We got a game coming up in a couple of weeks and a game might be your first midterm or your first presentation. 
Okay, and six of you uh, going out there, you've got all your equipment and then the other five, I know you don't have gloves right now, but you'll be fine. And I might give you a glove like in a couple of weeks from now, maybe after the first game, maybe in the championship, but I'll give you a glove, right? That textbook material is your glove, right? It's really a piece of the equipment. So how can we have students stay one, expect them to perform and be successful if they don't have all the equipment that they need to be successful? So we have to really think about day one access and the best way to do that is OER. So three wins, three wins, affordability, teaching and learning, and DEI and accessibility. That's your three wins. So the next thing um, I wanna get into, um, next thing I wanna talk about is our three, three foundations, and these will be uh, a little bit quicker, okay? But these are things structurally um, that as you're, working, um, as you're working with your colleagues at the college to think about sustainability of OER and what it can look like. These are things that you want to start thinking about putting in place. You wanna start embedding OER and ZTC into everything that you're doing, um, cause that connects back to funding. It connects back to plan. So West Hills College the more, I'll just give you a few examples. Um, we had a board policy and administrative procedure district wide at the beginning that defined OER and had some very specific things that we were encouraging people to do. At our college, with our latest strategic plan, it's one of our top three goals is to increase ZTC. Um, it's in our educational master plan that we just wrapped up last year. It's in our student equity plan. Um, we created very early on an OER committee with a faculty co-chair that reports to Academic Senate and an administrative co-chair that reports to our planning and governance council. So that's our participatory governance committee on campus. So that way there's lots of communication and lots of flow of communication related to, um, related to OER um, across the college. Next slide, please. Second foundation to be successful and to keep your OER evolution going is to make sure you have support and structures in place. So what is this? This is things like faculty champions. Um, it's so important that we have faculty. And if you're a faculty champion and right now you don't feel like you've got a lot of people following, like you're going, you're like revolution started. I'm all in. I'm saving students. I'm doing this in the name of equity. I'm doing this in the name of students and creativity and all of that. You're going. There's not a lot of people behind you. Don't worry. It'll happen. Um, it'll happen. They will start to follow. So faculty champions, um, you need a support team. Andy is a great example at CRC of an OER librarian. Um, and the support that they can provide and how crucial it is. Um, many of you want to start talking about instructional designers. So these are just ways to support your faculty. You need supportive and innovative administration who is willing to think outside of the box and support this journey for our students and for our faculty. Preferably some form of committee structure. Again, so that's for collaboration and communication. So it doesn't just feel like a, like a club or like this group's doing it, but this group's not. So everybody's involved. Um, institutional research partnerships. So one of the big things for us is really be able to quantify what we're doing, right? So quantify how many sections are available for ZTC, um, quantify things like looking at success data for students that are in ZTC courses. It's really important to have your institutional research team on board. Um, and then last but definitely not least, um, student voice and student ambassadors. That's the second foundation. <clears throat> uh, third foundation, Next slide, please. So the third foundation is, you know, I know a lot of you are saying, James, this is great, but all of this takes some kind of funding, right? It takes dollars and that's part of the strategy, right? If you're working it into your student equity plan and your educational master plan, then you start to think about allocating college and district dollars towards this movement, towards staffing, towards having a good structure in place. Out of the gate for us, we were very fortunate. Um, we received a grant from Achieving the Dream uh, to start an elementary education ZCC degree, uh, the chancellor's office. Uh, so that was our psychology degree. We had um, an innovation award that we received and we put money towards ZTC. We were a technical assistance provider along with College of the Canyons. We're currently part of a four college consortium in California that got a federal grant called CC Echo. So it's been, because it's been in our education master plan and our strategic plan, that means that we're writing and we're looking and we're seeking funding um, for the OER revolution. Um, more recently, in addition to that, um, other funding streams that many of you have, you probably have a regional consortium and so for your uh, career technical education. And so our regional consortium dedicated money towards ZTC development, our SEA funds, and then our categorical. So everybody, it's on everybody's mind. <clears throat> the good news now is uh, our chancellor's office has come to the table 
with $115 million. Right, I'll repeat that. I was, that wasn't 15. That wasn't like one and a bit. That was $115 million that we've now started to roll out. Right. So, and that was based on the initial um, based on the initial funding. So all of you should have received $20,000 for a planning grant, all of you being all of you California community colleges, all of you should have received $180,000 initial allocation and been asked to designate a go-to person at your college in terms of ZCC and OER, which leaves $90 million still out there, right? So the state's starting to roll out and has been rolling out what phase three will look like, but there's funding available now for all colleges. All right, last but not least, I wanna make sure that, I, that, I'm, that I'm timely and I think I'm going a few minutes over. Uh, last slide, please. So those are your three foundations and uh, your three wins. But last but not least, um, who are you gonna call myth busters? So there's some myths about OER that oftentimes becomes reason why um, people don't go into the OER revolution. Say, well, we'd like to do that, but, well, we'd like to do that, but, that sounds great. I, I'm, I'm on board, however, right? We start to talk through these things. So don't let myths and hurdles around OER and ZTC stop you from starting. Right, just get started. And sometimes it's a handful of faculty, sometimes it's one degree, um, sometimes it's one grant, sometimes it's one person, but just get started. So over the years, the myths have been the funding's not there. True, if you didn't have grants, but now not true, right? So we're busting that myth because everybody has at least $200,000 to start their OER evolution. Articulation, early on, a lot of concerns that um, courses without traditional textbooks would not articulate to the CSU or UC. We haven't experienced that. CSU and UC are now also moving into the same space. Um, lack of ancillary support materials. That's a challenge. I'll, I'll admit that 100%. But as we go along, there's changes that are happening. So I'll give an example for us. The one, the one reason in our college that is completely acceptable for not going into OER is when the quality is not there. Right? If a faculty member reviews all these different possibilities and says, you know what, this is not the same quality, um, this is not good material. That's that's a completely acceptable and real answer in many disciplines. But over the last seven years, that's changed. And I'll give an example of our math faculty. Um, they were using my math lab, Pearson product, about $120 for a course code. Um, and about four years ago, they looked at a, pr a product called My Open Math. Um, so this was put together by uh, a professor at Lake Tahoe Community College. Um, Larry Green, who hired a bunch of mathematicians and a bunch of coders and tried to create a math product that was similar to some of the textbook products. Four years ago, a math faculty looked at it and they're like, really cool. We don't feel like it's quite there quality wise. Two years ago, they looked at it and made the switch. And so all of our math classes now use my open math and our math faculty to add on to the quality have been coding and writing and programming and writing additional materials to remix, reuse um, and put in. So Lots of different possibilities there. And I think the ancillary support materials are definitely getting in better. better. As are um, OER resources in terms of availability, um, accessibility, and quality. All of those improving as more and more people jump into this revolution. Um, the last one is the bookstore. I think I saw a comment pop up related to bookstore. Um, that's a very different journey for each campus. Um, some of you have outside vendors. Some of you, it's local. That's something to talk with your leadership about. For us, our bookstore is now fully online because um, 70% of our courses don't require a textbook. Um, we do not have a physical uh, we do not have a physical textbook store or bookstore on campus anymore. Um, we now have a, in there we have a military services center and we have what's called our wind center, which is basically our, our career center. So we've taken that space and reallocated it for other needs on campus. So I just want to encourage you to focus on the why, um, which are the three wins, right? So teaching and learning, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility and affordability. Those are three wins across the board. Um, and I want to encourage you to let your OER revolution begin or continue depending on where you are um, in your journey. So thank you so much. Um, I guess I maybe open it up just for a couple of questions, Michelle, if there's a couple that we wanna pull and then hand it over to Andy for, for the story of um, CRC. If anyone has any questions, you can pop them in the chat or raise your hand. I have one. I want to make sure that that OE, OER evolution that 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 is openly licensed. We can use that. 
I don't, I don't think we've copyrighted it. So I think it's, I think it's out for the world. Yeah, we probably should have, but we didn't. So <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts? We can open it up again at the end too. Yeah, so I just saw a comment from Suzanne. Suzanne, good to good to see you. We were on the task force together. Yeah, well, I think um, I think Kelsey might. I'll I'll kind of look while Andy's talking, but I think Kelsey Smith might have put that in there already. Um, the board policies. I'll while Andy's talking, I'll a couple things. I'll post our uh, website that we have with all of our materials. I'll put that into the chat um, along with my contact information. If you you know, and I would love to talk with anybody who's available, or if you have additional questions um, after our session today. So this time I'm going to hand it over to Andy Atkins Pogue, who's uh, the OER librarian at CRC. Thank you, James, and thank thank you and Kelsey for all the work that you've done at West, West Hills Lemoore and all, all of your faculty who um, provided such a great example for us that are continuing this work. So my name is Andy Atkins Pogue, and I am a librarian at Kasumnas River College. We are part of the Los Rios Community College District, which uh, serves the Sacramento County region. We're one of four colleges there. Uh, a little bit about CRC, we have about 13.5 thousand students and about 600 employees. And the majority of those are faculty. Our full-time faculty, we have about 193. So you can see that we, like many other institutions, rely heavily on part-time or adjunct faculty. So it's really important to get them involved in initiatives like this. Our student demographics, about 75% of our students identify as non-white. 50% are living below poverty or are classified as low income, and about 30% of our students are first generation students. So we have the Anapizi and HSI designation, so Asian, Native American, Pacific Islander, and Hispanic serving institution designation for CRC. Next slide, please. So I'm going to take a few minutes here to talk about the title that we picked for our presentation, Education as a Right and Not a Privileged. So I believe that that should be true, that education should be a right and not a privilege. And I believe we should be doing everything we can to break down barriers so that education is accessible as possible to the most people as possible. And that is a founding principle of the California Community College system. So how do we convince our faculty that the issue of textbook costs is directly related to this? Well, I've been doing this work for about two years full time, and I can tell you that it is student voices that can be the most impactful in moving that needle. So CRC has a very diverse student population. You just saw that. We actually have a very diverse executive management team, but our faculty, like many institutions of higher learning, is predominantly white. And with that whiteness comes a lot of privilege. And so sometimes our faculty have a really, really difficult time stepping into the shoes of our students. I've heard things like, if my students can afford a cell phone or a, a laptop computer, then they can afford to buy my textbook. Or if my students can afford to get their nails done, then they can afford to buy my textbook. But oftentimes what we're seeing on the outside isn't indicative of what is happening in that student's life. So I had a discussion with a previously homeless student last semester, and she told me I had a cell phone and I had a laptop and I was showing up to class every day, but I wasn't sure where I was going to sleep every night. And so from all outside appearances, she seemed like she had it all together, but she was dealing with a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety connected with her housing insecurity and food insecurity. And, but she was still trying to get her education. I think our institutions, our processes, our classroom environments, we often favor the privileged. So when we're asking a student to buy a $150 or $200 textbook, we are favoring the privileged. 
And I hear arguments from faculty like, well, my, all my students get financial aid so they can afford to buy the textbook or I've made a special deal with the publisher so it's a lot cheaper than what it says at the bookstore or I let my students use any edition of the book and they can get a really cheap version on uh, Amazon or one of my favorites. <laughs> I found a free PDF copy of my textbook online. My student showed it to me. It's available for free for anyone. But again, these arguments are favoring the privileged because it is the privileged student who is tech savvy enough to know how to navigate the system and understand that there might be less expensive versions out there. Um, and remember, our students who are relying on financial aid, that financial aid does not kick in until well into the semester. So if they're relying on that money to purchase the textbook, they very likely will not have it on the first day of class. And I want to talk a little bit about that free PDF. So in most cases, if you find a PDF copy of a commercial textbook online, it very likely is a pirated copy that was posted illegally in violation of copyright law, which means it could be taken down at any point. It's also probably on a very questionable website that could put your students at risk for viruses or they're giving their personal information to this website. And really, as educators, is that the example that we want to set for our students to send them to a place that we know is violating the intellectual property rights of that author? I wouldn't want to do that, and I hope that you feel the same way. We also hear all the time and we talk about a lack of diversity in STEM and technology and business. And we are contributing to that lack of diversity when we're asking our students to buy a $200 textbook. We are favoring the privileged. So many institutions have grappled with systemic racism and trying to break down barriers and trying, the equity conversation is always um, in, in our forefront and we're talking about that so much. And often, often faculty can feel really overwhelmed and say, I'm just one person, what can I really do? Well, what you can do, and very easily in many, many disciplines, is to switch to an open educational resource or look for zero textbook cost options through your college library. I often will have faculty tell me, you know, I'm using this commercial textbook, but it's not great. There are things that are wrong with it. There's actually mistakes within the book. But that same person will then say, well, I can't use that OER. It's not great. There are mistakes in that book. But with the OER, you can correct those mistakes. You can change things. You can add things. You can edit things. You can bring lots of different sources together into one resource. And also what, what a great opportunity if you assign your students to help do research and rework the things that you aren't happy with and create something you are happy with, that would be a great active learning uh, situation for students and help you make uh, create a more culturally relevant um, textbook. So I believe that we need to be relentless in this type of message as we're sharing information with faculty. And I believe the most effective way to share this message is through your students. Get your student voices. So the video that is on the screen, I'm not gonna actually play the video today. It's about a six minute video, but we created it last year. We interviewed many students and we also interviewed some faculty who had converted their classes to zero textbook costs through OER. And we played it at convocation last year. And I believe that was one made one of the biggest impacts on our faculty that kind of moved the needle at our campus and got more people on board with uh, an initiative like this. Also on this slide, I've linked to some of the research and some of the news stories that have been done connected to our initiative at CRC. So just constantly bringing that student voice in and sharing it with faculty will help you move the needle. Okay, Selena, when you advance the slide, it's going to start playing the video, but if you click it one more time, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. 
So our accomplishments so far, I was asked to take on this project full time in fall of 2021. And at that time we had 162 zero textbook cost sections. Last spring, we had moved exponentially to more than 700 zero textbook cost sections, about 58% of our courses. Uh, and this fall, I just did an analysis last week, we're on tap already, we have more than 800 sections. And um, I'm still I'm still working with a few classes, so I believe that that number is even going to grow higher and we will have a higher percentage. That has equated to millions of dollars in savings for our students. And the more momentum that we've had, the more faculty that are willing to get on board and to investigate this and try it. So last semester, 261 of our faculty were teaching at least one zero textbook cost section. Okay, next slide. So how did we achieve this in such a short amount of time? Well, there was a substantial financial investment to make this happen. We uh, did provide faculty stipends to if our faculty committed to converting all of their courses to zero textbook costs. Uh, it was a $5,000 stipend for our full-time faculty and our part-time faculty. It was based on their FTE load at CRC. That financial investment also allowed me to work on this project full time, so I was reassigned outside of the library and they replaced my position with a long term temporary. That has been happening for two years and now I'm going to go into my third year to continue this work. And we were also able to hire temporary classified professionals to help support this work as well. The second thing is just the constant support. So this initiative really was the brainchild of our college president, Dr. Edward Bush. And because he is so passionate about this work, uh, all of our administrators, our deans, everybody was on board, which was great for me because I, whenever I ran into challenges or issues, I had unprecedented, and I still do have unprecedented access to administrators that help me work through these problems. We've had regular office hours to uh, support faculty as they're doing this work. We actually had at, at CRC, we are a guided pathways institution and our meta majors are called career and academic communities. So we abbreviate it to CACs. We had faculty representation for every CAC that held re regular office hours to support faculty within their areas. And we just did so much outreach so many emails and so much professional development related to this project. Um, part of that outreach, I was just sending a tremendous number of emails. Uh, I would send one to everybody at least once a week. And then I would often, if there were specific resources for a specific discipline, I was sending out more information to individual faculty members. And what I learned fairly quickly is that um, I needed to have a place where we could store all of this information so that faculty would have a place to go and refer for to later on. Um, I would often get emails saying, I know you sent this out last week and I'm looking for it and I can't find it. Can you please tell me, tell me this again? And so that's why I knew it was gonna be important that I had kind of a repository that was housing all of the stuff that we were creating which is a website that we created. And I'm actually doing a presentation later this afternoon at two o'clock. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about is the website, how we created it, um, what we used and what kind of information it includes. Okay, next slide. So lessons learned doing this project. Consistency is absolutely essential. And having a full-time faculty coordinator is I believe the only way that you're going to see big steps and momentum on your campus. Oftentimes, it's a librarian that's tasked with this work, which can create problems. So with a classroom faculty member, if you say, I'm going to give you 0.2 or 0.4 to work on this project, it's very easy for them to equate that to a class. So you're, you're going to not teach two classes, and you're going to spend that time instead working on this project. But with librarians, you're often, if, if you give me a 0.2 or a 0.4, 
very likely all of this other stuff I'm supposed to do is not going to be taken off my plate. And so I have this release time and we're backfilling it with an adjunct librarian, but often the high level thinking and long term projects can't be done with someone who's coming in for a semester or a year. And so it's really, I believe, very, very important to have a full time coordinator working on this. This is something I'm really passionate about and I'm hoping our chancellor's office will start recognizing this, just like we have distance education coordinators or tutoring coordinators, I believe that each college should have an OER slash ZTC coordinator who is overseeing this work and helping support faculty. Because I've been uh, working on this full time, I was able to, to just respond to faculty in the moment. So when they needed something, I was there, I could answer their questions um, and get them on the right path. Again, the, the student voices, I think I forgot to mention this on that back on that video. So it is linked in the, um, in the slides, the PDF slides. It has a Creative Commons license. Anyone is able to use it at your institution or perhaps you could use it as inspiration to help you um, create something with your own students. But having that student feedback and student voices is so critical to doing this work. We, I had regular visits to our student senate and I got so many great ideas from them on how we could create material and train our support staff so that they knew how to help students find this information. And James mentioned this, I'm also going to mention it. It's so important to get your research and your marketing offices involved in this type of work. So the research office at CRC has just been so helpful to me. We've done several different studies over the last two years, and faculty are often going to ask, you know, this here's another big initiative. Where's the evidence that it works? And if you have some evidence that you can point them to, um, it kind of shuts down that negative conversation and push, pushes you into getting some more momentum. One thing that we have done at CRC, because we have to, in the class schedule, designate which classes are zero textbook costs, it was very easy for our research office to grab that data. And we have a data dashboard that updates in real time from semester to semester where we can now connect um, ZTC as an option in our data dashboard. And so it's directly tied to student enrollment. We can see enrollment related to zero textbook costs and student success related to, to zero textbook costs. And this last statement is probably going to be a little controversial because I know we are an, at an open educational resources conference. But in some cases, OER is not always the answer. And um, the reason that I say that, especially in English or literature, where faculty really want their students to read current material that maybe isn't available in the public domain, and that kind of stuff is never going to be OER or it's not going to be in the public domain for years and years, you, you hopefully will investigate options to purchase ebook licensing through the college bookstore or um, in some of the career and technical education areas. There's just not a lot of OER out there. Or you have a single faculty member who is teaching that the entire series of classes and asking them to convert all of their classes is just a monumental task that many faculty, it's just so overwhelming, they can't even think about it. So one of the things that we have done at CRC is in some cases we've purchased class sets of books and made those available through the college library through controlled digital lending. And in many cases, we are using that as a stopgap. I have faculty who are, who are really passionate about this work and they wanna create OER, but they just need more time. And so this allows them the time to start working with others in their discipline to hopefully create something that's more sustainable over time. Okay, that's the end of my spiel. I think we're ready for questions. And I have seen the chat going, but I honestly have not um, had a chance to look at it. So if anything has come through there, maybe you can share it with me.